I'm opening. We have an eye, part of a nostril, two teeth. Hmm. One of the teeth has a small cavity. Close call, folks, but I think we got here just in time. Presented by Maria Menounos and Kevin Undergaro. This is Anatomy of a Movie. In-depth discussions and breakdowns of various movie titles. And now that you've seen the movie, let the dissection begin. Welcome back, everybody, back to Anatomy of a Movie. Today we are doing the dissection for R.J. Cutler's film, If I Stay. Now, I am your host, Marissa Serafini. (laughs) With me, I have... Oh, I'll start. Hi, guys. This is Sarah Stratton. Dimitri Panos. Hello, everybody. And you guys have re- been great about commenting and for all of our dissections. And you guys actually requested us to do this one. So here we are doing If I Stay. Thank you very much for all your suggestions. Keep them coming. And we'll do more dissections for you. All right. Your overall thoughts. W- very quickly, Sarah, we'll start with you. Uh, overall thoughts. Um, well, I can definitely say I was like emotionally affected by it. I like cried like five times in this movie. <laughs> um, I think I'm still maybe kind of emotionally <laughs> affected from it. Um, the overall, I really liked it. I think what held together for me was the music. I know that was a key part that RJ Cut wanted um, for this film. It was a big part of the inspiration for the actors. It was so, and that carried through and. I'm also a fa- I'm a little biased because, like you, Marissa, I am a fan of classical music as well. Yes. And so the fact that it had this range was really interesting to me that I could bounce around through different genres, and um, that really was the through line for me. Um, and then we'll talk about the relationships, how it was shot, and I think that the choice to kind of give it not make it linear was also a strong play on their part. Yes. Dimitri. Yeah, for me, this movie was a huge mixed bag that ultimately just ended up being a bag with contents was filled with a steaming pile of poo. The end, the last half hour of this movie, I was I was going along with it because I thought that there was I thought the positives outweighed whatever whatever little negatives going along. Mm-hmm. And for me, like I really liked Chloe uh, Chloe Grace Moritz's performance. Um, you know, I too it was a. I liked how the music was juxtaposed, but specifically watching her play the cello, uh, and, you know, knowing that she's not a celloist, uh, I thought it was very great how they mixed her in, and she took cello lessons for about seven months. But you know, I couldn't necessarily tell that they were using a double at certain. Could times. you tell? You could you tell the CGI head? I know. <laughs> I you know I read about the CGI head, and I was like, good play on their part. I mean. Movie magic. But movie magic. But you know what was amazing with her is I actually felt the emotion. Like she could have overplayed that part doing it, but I really truly felt that that character Mia, through Chloe Grace Moritz, was passionate about what she was playing, and it made listening and it made me more of a fan of cello music and I was like wow I was very impressed with that aspect like I loved watching that character play the cello um and you know I I I, to an extent I like the parents and I like there was a positive feel to this movie for for the most part um but like I said that last half hour like to say it fell off a cliff it, it it dove and it just pirouetted and it said and it ruined it for me. I walked away from that movie going, it had something, and then it just killed it by just stupidity, Padme, plot pointing, man is Why steel. stupidity? Well, Why do you say stupidity? A couple of things. I wouldn't say stupidity. Um, I, I agree the last half an hour did slow down after because all the, the stories have been revealed with the relationship, and now yeah. it's just like, what happens now? Well, now it's just waiting. Oh, but I wouldn't call it stupidity. You know, yeah, yeah, for me, it was just... it's. Bad plotting, bad, and it could have happened in the book. I don't know. Has anybody read the book? I, I have didn't. not read the book, okay. ba- but this film was yes, based right. on Gil based Foreman's on young adult novel. novel. Um, you know, I, I mean, for me, it all started with the grandfather, played wonderfully by Stacy Keach, came in and had that and had that speech with her, uh, and I call it I call it it was a bad it was the Man of Steel 
uh, you know, Pa can't die syndrome, where just to set this up in Man of Steel, there's a scene in which there's a tornado coming. The Kents are in a car. They all get out to go over an underpass. Okay, so it's Ma, Pa Kent, and Clark Kent, and uh, they forget the dog. So Pa Kent, instead of Clark Kent, goes to get the dog. The tornado's coming, upends a car. He gets pinned in the car, Pa Kent. He finally gets out. The dog escapes, and the tornado's coming, and Clark Kent can save him. And Kevin Costner nobly puts up his hand. He says, no, because your secret's too, too important, and he nobly, like, sort of kind of sacrifices himself. And in that scene in the movie, I'm going, what mother, what wife, what loving wife would say, oh, it's okay for you to die. It's like, I have a son who can save you and we can deal with the ramifications after that, but she lets him die. In this movie, we have a grandpa who comes in and basically says, you can die if you want. I give you permission to die. Like, this is his only link to his son, the only living relative, and to say, I'm going to make a sacrifice. You can die. Like He didn't say, I'm going to make a sacrifice. He goes, I, I did he, not get that message yeah, at all. I, I, like, I, I don't saw know the any mess- grandfather yeah. who would ever, like your last living relative, I, I don't know of any grandfather who would ever say, it's okay to die. Like, you can die. No way. I, I mean, did, I, did I don't buy that at all. Sarah would, I, didn't, I didn't feel that way in the movie. Like, that's not what it came across. I think it's a valid point. I think that when you really dig into it and you talk about like legacy and how people feel about their family line going on, if you've lost that many people, that that actually is very true. Like people, if that is the end, if you've lost so many people, you do cling to whatever you have left. Thinking back on it, I think that's a valid point. Did I get that immediately while watching it in the movie? No. No. Um, While I was watching the movie, I like... I guess I saw that he was he was at least conveying to me so much that he was in pain mm-hmm. that I was allowed to, that's what I was mm-hmm. more connected to in the speech that I really wasn't completely processing from his angle his thought process. I was like, "Oh my gosh, this man is yeah. in pain and she is getting that peace that she needed to feel okay about it." And I, like I was seeing it like, "Oh, this girl needs to, to be, be urged to die." I'm like <laughs> Just like no, she has not, nowhere to look, urge. she's I lost, think, and it was like at least some sort of di- sense of direction, some sort yeah. of like it's like when someone's grieving, someone tells you it's okay for you to be upset for a while. Sure. And like to me, that was the feeling. It was like it's it's to the extreme where it's like you, it's like we understand you, this is so hard. Like it's okay for you to feel this upset for you to want this. I under I think looking back, being like, that's a strange motivation is true. It didn't read that way to me while mm-hmm. I was watching it in the movie, at least. Yeah, it hit me just as soon because it was starting off as this emotional piece. And again, Stacy Keach, uh, you know, he was in uh, Nebraska, <laughs> and his character was so polar opposite. But it was for those of again, you who have not seen Nebraska, yeah, he plays like a asshole. tough old man who yeah. like kind of turns sure. out to have like such a awful oh, streak awful like awful. that you're kind of like and he, uh, and and it, it, it did stick with him he did such a good job in yeah. nebraska that you're kind of like well, i don't he trust you as here, much right. anymore and <laughs> but seeing him in this movie as the grandfather role i was like you know i, I always like when you can come off a of playing off of a role like that right. and i was like going oh wow he's really like okay it's good and it started off but the moment he said I give you permission to die, which is basically what he said. Mm-hmm. I'm like, whoa, 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 hell, hold on one minute. This is like your, no, no loving grandparent, no loving family would say, give up the fight. Not when there's the hope and of I've, there being. I'm not, I get living. the message that yeah. you're trying to go for. I think you're taking it at face value that like, okay, yeah, you can die if you want. I think it's more so because he's lost so much in his life already with losing his family and now she has lost so much in her life is she did decided to you know keep living and stuff so it was really and it's out of his hands you know he doesn't have control of it and maybe she didn't even have control the other moment it's just an odd conversation it is but to to tell somebody i didn't mind i would say fight yeah no no i didn't mind if it was odd because it was such an emotional scene that overlooks the the i guess you can say you can die yeah um, i didn't one moment, a moment it does remind me of that i have found in the past in other movies i'm okay with is that 
that pitiful scene where someone's been mortally wounded. You know they're not going to make it. This mm-hmm. isn't the same situation she's in a coma, you no. don't know. But, like, you know what scene I'm talking about. They're in the war. Someone has, like, a spear Absolutely. going through their stomach and, like, their best friend Game is there. Thrones. Yeah, just being Game like, being like, had it. being like, you can let go. Right. It's okay. Or you can be like Arya and just turn around and walk away. <laughs> But, you know, I, yeah, no, you're right. But, like, but I, maybe that's coma. kind of what they were going for, is, like, that type of instance of, I, like, I you know. can release. I, I just don't accept it. I don't accept it as a living relative when when, mm-hmm. when it can go right, Maybe way. not Game of Thrones, but more Terms of Endearment. <laughs> yeah, but that was terminal. Like, that yes. you knew. This was, like, you know, it's it was weird because at that point, I'm like, why is the nurse the most sympathetic? She's the one who's rooting for her to live. Like, you know, mm-hmm. and, of course, like, I think the boyfriend... Um, uh, Adam uh, and such but then you know that leads me to the other point where you know then the movie completely lost me so you had that and again I'm going to say for the positive side when she makes up the idea and this was the Padme plot point like again and I'm bringing up uh, Star Wars Episode 3 the the line you know she's totally fine sir uh but it's as if she's just given up the will to live, and and Padme just has these Padme. two babies, Padme uh, Amidala, yeah. and oh Luke, oh Leia, and like she dies, and because she's given up the will to live after she's just given up, like she just had two babies. Again, I go, what mother would give up the will to live after giving? And now we have Chloe Grace Moritz's character Mia. Yeah. Pretty much giving up the will to live, and she's going off into the light. Don't look into the light, Carrie Ann. And then we. I heard wouldn't the say music. she was giving up whatsoever. I say I she, was she was definitely up. contemplating. I know she was about she to was head torn. out the doors. She I was going torn. out the doors. There's, there's she, two torn. more factors. She was going out there's... the doors until the music played, which again, you're like, oh, how's this? Where's this coming from? And she comes back, mm-hmm. and I thought it was a nice scene that she had the headphones on. I was like, oh, okay, nice audible. That's a nice audible key in there, mm-hmm. and I like that. And it was playing out nicely. And then he took the headphones off, and it's like, oh hey, look, uh, look what's stashed underneath the bed here—an acoustic guitar. All of a sudden, he becomes the fucking like singing nun, and I'm like, wait a minute, he's an artist. Like, what? Everybody gather around, everybody. I'm gonna do a little song for her. I'm like, you're an artist who can record. You already had the nice thing, and you set up the headphones. You could have recorded the song instead of the kumbaya moment. Yeah, but also that kumbaya moment. It, it was because throughout the whole film, we saw her say, you never wrote a song for me. And then this but was... But he's saying I you could have done that in the headphones He could have recorded without. that song when you had the nice moment no, but when he like, played. But instead, if you record he, it, it's not as meaningful as your actual performing. Uh, to me, that that blew it for me. I'm like, you know what would have made, you know made that scene great? If he sang the Smith's Girlfriend in a Coma. I would have laughed hysterically. That would have been great. But instead he takes out, oh, look well, look what just happens to be here. An acoustic guitar for me to, like, I'm going to sing this song for you. Mm-hmm. It would have been nice had they continued that audible theme just with the headphones on that he record. I mean, he's an artist. And maybe he performed that song live and that was a live thing for her. I mean, we still would have gotten the same message without that sappy corniness. That, and then I was just, that. then I was completely keyed out of the movie. And I was like, oh. That's a bummer. So, Sarah, I, I did you know. like that moment? Oh, well, I want to talk a little bit more about that everything that you just brought up and you brought up, where, for instance, like her choice to walk towards the doors. This was my justification for it. I'm not sure if you agree with me or whatnot, but we we were given at least that we knew how she. We know that she knew if she walked towards the light, it was the end. Right. You get that that hint of how she walk, how she will die very early. Mm-hmm. What we're not given is, or what she is not given, is how she gets back in her body. Like that's never something that she's not let on. It's not like, oh, I can sometimes move my hands, or I can walk towards the light. Mm-hmm. It was this girl's a little bit clueless. It's not a straight up decision where she's either walk towards the light or. It's she's still trying to figure out how to get back. Like they're telling, she repeats over and over again, "I'm fight." Like they say, "You have to fight," and she's like, "I don't know how. Right. I don't know how this fighting is happening." So on that aspect, I'm like, okay. So she's a little lost. The only one, she only has one direction that she really can head that she knows where it's going. Right. And then we got that 
turning point in the very beginning when she finds out Teddy is an orphan too, where she's like, you are my reason to fight. Right. I will not leave you. And this is a grief-stricken girl who then, you know, four-fifths, three-quarters of the way in the movie, then finds right. out her brother is gone. Right. So now it's like, I have absolutely nothing. I think my boyfriend's gone. I thought I said goodbye to him. And my brother's gone. My grandpa's told me it's okay. And I don't know what to do. And I don't know how to get back there anyway. So I'm going to go to the pretty light because... Because the... Because what else, what, what else do you do? You... It's you, like she's I mean, staring at her body. She's waiting in this room, what we assume to be for hours, just listening to people talk to her. Nothing's really happening. She's not, like, getting back in her body. She's just sitting there, waiting, watching people suffer around her. And so that's how I went through it, where mm-hmm. by the end, I was like, I kind of get it. I kind of get that you're really lost and really grieving and have don't seem to have any alternative besides sitting and waiting and going towards the light where you seem to find some sort of pull of her family or like her dad or something. There seems to be Mm -hmm. some inclination. That was my rationale for the whole thing. Back to what originally, where this ends up, where she gets pulled out by the headphones. Loved the headphones. Mm -hmm. I wanted some sort of line for like, I really wanted that to be like her playing. I really wanted to him to have like gotten a hold of her like audition and it'd be like, that was you. Like mm-hmm. that was you See, or something that too is a that's a like that would have been amazing. That's something that I want as well. I, that actually would have been amazing more than the whatever the it was that the the, His. the, the cello piece mm-hmm. that has been. Mm-hmm. But I, I I liked how it was the cello piece that mm-hmm. sort of kind of wait before Hold this. You know, she's more or less she tells whatever whomever after this piece. And yeah. she goes to find, and I was confused because I was like, why is this coming through? Why is this coming through the speakers? Mm-hmm. Because nobody knows what's really internally what's going on. So when she comes back and you found out that it was the headphones, I was like, oh, that's sort of clever. Yeah. Uh, I like that. That's a mm-hmm. good. That was and, nice device. It was a nice cue. It was a very nice cue for her to listen to that. Mm-hmm. And if she was going to choose to go out, to go out on that, but it would have been even like, hey, you know how you. I, but it, it, it was also a message that, like, if you do stay, you do have all this music. That yeah. You do have a reason it to just, live. This is something that literally has been your whole life. It's like you're not completely mm-hmm. lost just because you don't have a, a technically your biological mm-hmm. family. You still have friends. You still have music. You still have motivation. She in still life. does her, have bi- biological mm-hmm. family and her grandparents. Yeah. And her parents. And but, yeah, like, I, no know. immediate family no, per se. I, you I, still was, have motivation to keep going. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, But I would figure that that would have come... Be, you know, a, a lot of it at the end when I looked at it was, oh, well, you know, because um, Adam like says, I'll move to New York. I'll make this work. And it's like, oh, so all of that stuff inspired you to live when you and had lot, other things. To and look, a lot of the know. book readers were really upset about that. They said that that's something that kind of this movie brought away from the book mm. where the love story was obviously a huge component of the book. Yeah. But the, the book actually had more family. And mm. more of the grandparents and more of mom. And so I th- I'm i assuming right. that that was a greater inclination of the mm-hmm. realization of that right. one speech with her friend that you do have outside right, family. Right, 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 I right. think yeah. made more of an impact. Yeah. Um, and then in addition, I, sorry, I'm bringing it back to the headphones. Yeah. Because it's an interesting choice that there was no explanation of why he picked that song. Mm-hmm. Like... Because if you look at it not from her perspective, which is like she, you know, all of a sudden hears this, but his, that he's going to put headphones on his girlfriend for one song, then that song must be the most important song you can possibly think of. Was it the song? So what is it? Was it the song that when he took her to the concert that the celloist was playing? That's what I was thinking, but I had forgotten. Yeah. I didn't I'm, know. And I they didn't, played so much classical music. That I couldn't yeah. recognize what I yeah. needed. I needed a line. I needed something yeah. telling me why that was the yeah. song. I needed something telling me like, this is why I loved you. Like when you played this, like right. I will always, well, like I needed I really, something. I really know the, 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 that would have been an amazing script suggestion to say, hey, I was able to, mm-hmm. I explained the situation to Juilliard and, uh, you know, I've listened to this and this is you, but, you know, I've always, uh, you asked me why I haven't written a song about you, 
please take a listen to this. I mean, we right. would have heard it through the headphones as well. Yeah. Um, I just, again, I or thought Or if we went straight headphone... into his song on the headphones, and that's right. what pulls her back. Yeah. I don't, I don't I mean, know. I just thought that, to me, the headphones was a nice touch. And it, it wasn't the singing nun, let me take out my acoustic guitar, and let me sing to you in the hospital. That just sort of kind of, mm. whatever goodwill I was having at the movie, those two incidences, which came at roughly the half hour you know, within the last half hour. I mean, because up to that, I was looking at some positive things. And for me, the positive things were, uh, ultimately, they were good kids, right? Wouldn't you agree? I mean, they were yeah, good like high school Yeah, head on kids. their shoulders. Head on their shoulders. They had motivation. They Motiva- had goals mm-hmm. in life. Mm-hmm. And, and solid, good goals in life. Yeah. And, I, you know, and it, it, sometimes teenagers aren't portrayed that way. And, you know, and, and I liked that, that they had these goals and they had a passion and and they explored that passion and they I, I appreciated that i appreciated how they had parents who were well she had parents not him but not adam but mia had parents that were supportive they 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 mm-hmm. they wanted her to go to like they supported julie they supported whatever she wanted i love the parents but yeah the, you know i i enjoyed how they were supportive of what she wanted to do um yeah um sorry to get no, to go no. off of that like yeah. i loved how the parents their their role in her her life which is great because we know her parents are like punk rockish growing up and right. like, they were rebels teen rebels and sure. then like they they understand like young love and you know have fun you know this is the time where you mess up in life right. so like i love that that was that fun they added the fun comedic element yeah. to a somewhat of a darker more toned down story but also just like not letting because they liked a certain type of music and and mia loved classical she was more serious more more gravitas kind of music and but they didn't let her feel bad about that you know they let her be her own they let her play the cello from hours into the night and i loved how they were supportive in that way oh absolutely and i I, there was a nice scene when um she was practicing the cello and it was all hours of the evening yeah and they were outside her door because they weren't getting any sleep because she's playing the cello at three in the morning and they're going yeah this is what we created you know and the father said yeah this is ours. Like we we made this, and there was a problem. Is now my my one caveat about the parents is being that they were such music fans. Like it would have been nice. I didn't see why there needed to necessarily be the split between rock and roll and classical because there are so many rock and roll musicians who started off as classical musicians or who who were trained to be something else other than what they ended up getting into. And and in rock and roll, there's always rock and roll. There's an infusion of all various different kinds of music within it. I mean, you know, ELO always has classical type violin in their music. Sting was a jazz bassist, and he infused that in some of the police songs and later on in his solo albums. You know, um, St. Vincent, I believe, was brought up playing a violin. Mm-hmm. Um, you have so many instances where Pat Benatar was 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 uh, a classically trained opera singer. Yeah. So. It would have been nice to say, hey, you know, we love that you're class. I mean, she's learning from the basics and you're learning the best, but there could have been like a, 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 there could have been the intimation that it could be infused with anything you want this to be because you're Mm -hmm. learning the hardest thing to learn. And like sometimes there seemed to be a split when I think music is an art form, like just because he's a rock and roller. I can understand that, but that also reflects her character too because we see her go to concerts with uh, Adam's concerts and stuff and she's like purposely not having fun. She just doesn't enjoy it and that's just her as a character. Therefore, there causes the split between the Mm. classical and the pop. If she did enjoy it and like, or at least pretended like she enjoyed well, it. Well, she always liked then the music. She liked the music. Yeah. She, she liked felt the like music. A fish out of water with the crowd. She was definitely fish and, out of water. And that's kind of how split. I felt like that she created the split. It wasn't really mm-hmm. imposed by her parents. Mm-hmm. I felt like she created this like mental bubble right. that she mm-hmm. was different, that she had to be classical. Yeah. And I think that like um, that is like kind of a realistic thing for kids to do, like to see themselves as different, so they're not a part of it, or like to see herself as a little bit off and not in the right, right boat. Yeah. Um, 
And I think that that what it did it, is it made the scene stronger where she finally did accept that she could be part of it, mm-hmm. where she does come out and join the bonfire and play the child. And that's what made it happy because she finally broke through. It wasn't everyone else's wall she was breaking through. Mm-hmm. She had to like break through her <laughs> own because um, she was the one causing that division. Yeah. And so for me, because I, I mean, I know that the directors, the, you know, I'm sure you guys heard, like they all gave them all their iPods with the music. And I know her... I- her iPod in particular did have everything from classical um, classical um, music to classic rock cause, or what her parents would have listened mm-hmm. to and infusions of ones that right. did have classical instruments in more rock. So she, it wasn't that like the filmmakers were unaware of that existence or that it could be meshed. I definitely think it was a character thing no. um, that she was creating this whole like she had to be alone and she not liked her see, one thing yeah she didn't see what it could be no. until we get that scene and that's why that scene's important mm. yeah. yeah and you know i mean the other thing that i liked i also uh, you know i liked the um the juilliard ceiling in the bedroom mm-hmm. although you know dopey me is like going Where's the ladder? Like, how did he do that? Like, well, well, like that was <laughs> he the did thing the the and, and then he would jump. all that tape and then all that tape tape and jump and taping. <laughs> right? No, but it was. I wish I my boyfriend did that. <laughs> I got the scene, and then when she went for the audition, I was waiting. I was like, going, well, she has to look up. I mean, she had, mm-hmm. she ha- and I was waiting for her, going, when are you going to look up? Because you can't blow. That scene, and then when she looks up, she got the smile on her face. I wish it paid off a little more. Like I wish she truly said to him, you know, I looked up at the ceiling. You know, I did go to bed every night up until the thing, and I looked up at the ceiling, and you inspired me, and I believe it was because of that I played the best I've ever played in my life. I love you for that because it really pushed me to go forward, and I wanted a little more of the payoff, but I didn't quite get the full payoff but it was I think nice it, that it definitely did. played its part um, and that wasn't Juilliard that was the San Francisco Ju- Auditorium oh, okay uh, but yes okay. I thought it was romantic mm-hmm. first of all I mean any boy to do that awesome um, but and then just like it shows how comfortable and how much she does love music mm-hmm. even if she's scared about it she can still do it mm-hmm. and no matter where she performs and whatnot, that's who she is and that's like how she loves performing mm-hmm. and I thought that I saw the payoff when she looked up and she did smile and that was good enough for me no. it would have been nice for her to say it was your like because she said hey I, you know I thought it was the best but it would I, for me. It would have been nice to acknowledge that, like his his efforts, really, really, like it sort of kind of seemed to go silent. And like it would have been nice to say, yeah, you really helped inspire me because I looked up and all I could do was think about it, and I went right into my music and I got into that zone. You broke the ice for me. I was so nervous and just thinking of you and what you did it really helped me along and but. and the thing with adam is that he was very accepting of her type oh. of music too which i loved and you know we're talking a lot about the music we'll definitely get to the character development yeah, yeah, yeah. more so but and we're kind of working our way backwards we're going very non-linear <laughs> with this uh this podcast um but also one of their first interactions either when Mia's playing the cello in the music room and Adam walks by in the hallway and just even from that small moment that's like yes this girl is talented she loves music and intriguing and whatnot and that shows that Adam just loved music in and of itself too whether it be classic or rock or anything. Diving more into character like how did you guys feel about Adam as a character in this as the leading man i liked him and um played by of course jamie blackley who is <laughs> british and i didn't expect that so i mean that was that was pretty surprising very good on his part for losing mm-hmm. the american accent i i did enjoy this character only because we've already established when the the teenagers in the high school they're like he's the lead singer of the band he's this he's right. that and you he we already have established that he's like popular he's probably from stereotype like more rebellious out of her league whatever mm-hmm. and then to find out he's kind of completely opposite and to break that stereotypical belief i th- i found that really refreshing yeah i i found his i found both their characters refreshing um i found his refreshing because again he's in a rock and roll 
He's in high school. Okay. We've seen a ton of teen movies. Mm-hmm. Amongst, mm-hmm. amongst us, we've seen a lot. And a <laughs> lot. one common thread is that there's always a party and they're always getting drunk. That's a motivation. His motivation, like, he wasn't an alcoholic. He, 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 you know, I'm not saying he didn't tip. He had a shot or whatever. I'm not, but he was... He loves doing what he, he's a responsible yeah, he's rocker. Yeah, he's very responsible. Well, but you know, again, sometimes when you know, maybe I don't know. I just think that sometimes with a teen movie, it's sort of kind of refreshing to see kids who are responsible and you know who have and not a goal. Perfect, and then and don't, exactly because mm-hmm. he wasn't perfect. I mean, you know, but mm-hmm. yet they're good kids nonetheless and this is why i like movies like even super bad or the john hughes movies ultimately love john hughes they're good kids and they are responsible kids even though they get into trouble they're responsible kids um so i I liked him and i actually thought that their chemistry together worked and there are even aspects of their romance that actually you know worked because i felt it was sort of real um listen, when you're graduating high school there are so many unknowns whether you're into music or not mm-hmm. you have a love in high school they may be going to college over here you're going over there and i think they showed and that pretty well I with agree. relationships i found that very believable it's like you are getting older you are going separate ways to fulfill your own personal yes. dreams yeah and it did deal with it i thought it was realistic no matter it didn't matter that one was they were both pursuing music but in different parts I felt at least it brought it up. Um, It was refreshing to me to see a young adult movie played out where nobody had to take charge of a revolution. Nobody needed a crossbow to do it. Mm -hmm. We didn't have to, you know, it wasn't dystopian. It was more, it was a little more grounded. I felt that the kids at the beginning, they were grounded. Um, And like I said, I liked the parents because they were supportive of, they were supportive of the relationship. They were supportive of Mia to me a lot of those parts ended up being somewhat refreshing to me i was Mm -hmm. like this is a good interesting like this was an interesting way to portray kids that we're not getting a lot of in movies today i think so you know those are some of some of the more i did have positive things about the movie Mm -hmm. it was just the negatives outweighed sarah what were your thoughts on adam adam um i really liked his character i one of the layers that i found surprising that i really liked was it was it was to me it was like pretty subtle it wasn't too in your face where they talked about his family and about how his family wasn't there and so how he constantly was like worried about abandonment but how he, we got to actually see that he was the one who was more physically abandoning her right. um because and i thought that that was just like an interesting little just note that they added in for him and i think it's sometimes you have to leave first before someone else leaves yeah but it's also leave. that sometimes people like yeah they put characteristics that they're familiar on on someone else and they don't see them actually doing it themselves mm-hmm. like they've been, like they're so conditioned to kind of react a certain way and it's like the one way they're trying not to react is what they're actually doing right. um and to me that was just like an interesting little note that they added for him um and they didn't make him like they didn't make him the perfect boyfriend who she needed to come back to right. they she mm-hmm. they didn't and so they they just switched him up a little bit. They didn't make him Prince Charming, and they didn't make him the horrible rock and roll guy. They tried to fit him somewhere in the middle, um, on different and give him different layers. I did believe their chemistry when they were together in their scenes together. I did feel it. Mm-hmm. I my one qualm was I wasn't completely sold when they talked about each other, not in the presence of each other. Those scenes stuck or out for me when the particular scene when Adam's talking to Mia's friend on the roof. Ta- Adam's talking to Mia's friend on the roof, or when I don't know they would have like phone calls that they were actually detached from each other, or when Mia mm. was talking to her mom about him. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe it was just because I missed them on screen together and I liked the dynamic they had and you could feel it, but it kind of would dissipate when they were separate. Um, not horribly not anything that i was like oh this is a movie they have no feelings right but it just it, just, it was a little bit of a, a change I that you. i noticed and I, so i i yeah it was it was a factor for me as i watched okay i agree i did like both of their chemistry on screen when they, they played off each other so well they did. and the fact that yes he was the more rocker and mm. he was classic 
that was a nice mix yeah, in and of itself I'm a little too. bit country I'm a little bit rock and roll kind exactly. of things and, and, and therefore I thought there was a nice balance of each other mm-hmm. and, and that and I wonder I think that were they I don't know if you guys read this but I heard a rumor that they were they were t- together for part of this filming like in actuality like the actors you know I, I read something even... where Chloe said that they had hung out but they were According to her, they were just friends. So whether there was any onset romance, that I that I don't know if they were together. It's been I would have rumored. I mean, mm, it's been rumored, I mean, but it's like it's an interesting. She's I, I know, on yeah. That. Chloe Grace Moretz is with the someone else. Uh, Beckham the, the Beckham, kid. yeah, I saw the that. The son morning. of David Beckham. Mm-hmm. I forget his name. Currently, right now, as of September two thousand fourteen, yes. we'll see about that. But what did you think of Chloe's character and how she portrayed Mia? And the fact that she took seven months of training to learn the cello. Um, cello. <laughs> she is a fan of classical music, but I think she played for as physically demanding as playing the cello is. I think she sold it pretty well, well the, despite they, the fact that they did. You know, they ended CG up using a double her for her. But yeah, she said after all that, and you know, with the movie Magic, she said she came out of the movie with a deeper appreciation for, with, music. for yeah. classical music and the technicality of everything. It, I think that I'm sure a part of it was like a little bit disappointing that she had trained so hard and then they couldn't use her. But I think she probably, despite our use, learned so much from practicing that hard. Yeah. Like just putting that in your body every day, like having that mentality, you it's research. It's knowing it's, so much yeah. that like, even if they had told her from the get go, hey, we're, we need to use a really strong chalice from this. We're getting this girl from Juilliard. Like, great. So you don't need to learn. Like, I've been like, but you should learn anyway because it's going to give you so much. So I think all in all, it added to her performance that she already had to do that. And it probably was so. allowed her to tap in more to feeling the music. Yeah. I, mean, I, I Yeah. I mean, I, until today, like with the CG head and, and the double, I was wondering because she looked like she was performing to me Mm -hmm. and if they were doing you know there were good cutaways you know to Mm -hmm. put in a stand in um again i felt that i i thought she captured the emotion of Mm -hmm. like i got into her moments when she was playing the cello going oh she's it looks like she's playing the cello yeah i i was buying into it and i bought it yeah she had it wow she bought it for the most part Yeah. yeah in in i thought she, I think she's a fine young actress. Um, I was at Lionsgate when we released Kick Ass. And mm-hmm. <laughs> as Hit Girl, and at the age that she was at, that was the most that was the most talked about aspect of Kick Ass. Mm-hmm, yeah. And in fact, many reviewers and many audience, you know, if you talk to anybody, they say it was Hit Girl's movie. Yep. So Chloe Grace Moritz had that movie. But she had to say some pretty vulgar Nasty things. Nasty words. Mm-hmm. And, you know, her parents were great. And the director was great to sit with her and say, okay, you, you, this is what we're going to have her say. Yeah. And, you know, but she, she, she did it. She was fantastic. And I was like, wow, she was so good in this movie. I'd like to see what she does. And she's definitely, I put her in the L Fanning category. I mean, I really think she's a talented, I think she's our future I have a just a quick question. I don't yeah. mean to Did you mean to say L or did you mean uh, yeah. to say Dakota? Dakota. Because Dakota, she was actually in the running with Dakota Fanning for this film. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, because I, I I think L Fanning's a better actress than Dakota. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, I like, I'm a big L Fanning fan, but I'm a big Chloe Moritz fan. And I, and I love the choices that she has made in movies thus far. Um, from Kick-Ass to being in Carrie, but one of my favorite movies that she's done was Let Me In, which is the remake of the Swedish horror vampire movie, Let the Right One In. in, And she was so good in that movie. And that's when I said, okay, she's got the goods. And I think that she'll continually grow and hopefully Elle Fanning, you know, look, Jennifer Lawrence is only 23, 23, 24. She's 23, I'm pretty sure. So, I mean, she's only about seven years ahead of, say, uh, of, say um, Chloe. Chloe. But I think Chloe can get there. I think she's choosing some good roles. Even when she was talking about this movie, she said, I got to stretch my ability and I get to mm-hmm. learn more. And you can see her as an actress doing that. And I just think she's, she's good to watch. Uh, mm-hmm. I think she's, you know, I hope, 
she continues picking like good movies and I think she has some good people behind her. It seems like her family is supportive and they keep her level mm-hmm. as well. Um, so, and I did not know that Dakota Fanning was up for this role yeah. as well. I, and she, I, she was up with this role along with Emily Browning. Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, yeah, but the thing I liked with Chloe, because I have seen the kick-ass movies and I mostly know her for those films, so I had like completely mm-hmm. different. And there's only a handful of dramatic roles that I've seen Chloe actually portray. So I, w- I was more used to the kick-ass, mm-hmm. hard-talking kind of person. But to, I was very pleasantly surprised to find out like she, all of her emotional scenes and just like how she portrayed it, and I thought it was really wonderfully acted by yeah. her. I- I think it was it was an interesting opposition for me too, because I loved the kick, kick-ass films. Um, but we talked a little bit earlier about um, Stacey Keach, who's yes. an amazing actor. Yeah, and he's he, been doing it for a couple of years. Just, just a few, just, a just few. been a few productions. <laughs> and you know, so like the last movie he did, we talked about, or the last movie I've seen he did, Nebraska. We got that cruel thing, and it and, yeah, it, and just, it overshadowed a little bit of today, where I was like of. Um, of this movie where I was like a little bit nervous sometimes when he was on. And then for her, I thought I was going to feel the same way. I thought I was going to expect this kick-ass girl. And so I was shocked by my own believability that she was so kind of meek in this movie. Did you ever see Hugo? I mean, she was fantastic in Hugo too. And again, completely different from But I just thought it was a really good choice. I I wasn't getting the carryover from Kick-Ass that I was going to be like, oh, and now she's going to be able to throw a punch at this rocker show and all of a sudden she's going to fit in. Like, I really did believe that she was like this kind of meek, more, you know, poised, smart, Mm -hmm. deep And Chloe did say that, like, Mm -hmm. if she goes to concerts, she would mosh pit. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. She would have And so I think that's a really good like acting thing that I believed that she could change all that and mm-hmm. be completely someone else. I thought it was, that yeah. was like an interesting just. And for me, she's, she sold me and I bought it that she could play the cello. It, she could have so overplayed that. Cause mm-hmm. you've seen actors do that when you know that they don't know how to play piano. Oh, piano, And they might exactly. overdo it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they're not playing the piano. And she, it was all about emotion and it was mm-hmm. all about getting into, like the, the, the scene where she was um, auditioning I thought was great. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. thought it was. I thought it was fantastic. And you bought like, wow, that was amazing. Even though it may not have been her. So, and she never, you know, she said she practiced for seven months, but she never had any illusion that she could play the cello, mm-hmm. and which is fantastic. But at least she does admit she goes, what it taught me was the passion of music, and mm-hmm. she has a new appreciation, a deeper so. appreciation, yeah. and the fact that her character also loves Yo Yo Ma. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I I enjoyed that because I grew up with classical music, and I've right. actually seen Yo Yo Ma in person, like in, oh, okay. in person. Like I've seen his his concerts. He's amazing cellist. And like uh, the performance I went to, he went down my row. He was probably like five feet away from me. It was awesome. Did you get his autograph? No, <laughs> but I got an amazing concert out That's of him. That's awesome. So, uh, you know, the, it was just those little things that they threw in, like just how much she did love classical music. Mm-hmm. The, I love Yo Yo Ma sticker in her locker. So it's like, it was her life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They, was that really was nice. very apparent also in their production design in like the t shirts, Adam, mm-hmm. where like they did put a lot of effort into just putting little references everywhere right. and not calling out being like a nice shirt just letting it be part of their lives right yeah and also uh chloe herself she said when she first got the script for this film she hadn't read the book so she was simultaneously reading the script and the book at the same time mm. and she said from the book she loved the story of, of mia's mia's character and everything and then she wanted to really portray the authenticity of the character from the book right. onto the screen um in the and in the script so she also worked with uh, i mean gail Foreman wrote the novel but she also helped with the writing as right. well but and also mm-hmm. Shauna Cross who did the screenwriting. Right. Well, so she she really worked with those two women to portray Mia as authentic as she right. could. And it's interesting too because reading up on Gail Foreman, the the thing that I was I think most surprised about her is that she's not a musician at all. So, you know, yeah. which I find, you know, because music plays such a big part of this and knowing how to or learning to play and knowing how to play plays such a big part in this movie but mm-hmm. she also talked about too and which i found very interesting is that she says that that writers now are taking more part in the movies that they are that they're selling their books mm-hmm. for 
and you know she got an executive producer role and that she was more or less as that role she was a consultant with with the director and with chloe and with everybody else which i which i think is really interesting because she's right there there has been and i think it was jk rowling who probably changed that because she was so protective of harry potter Mm -hmm. that you know she did want to be one way shape of you know involved with the project and then um uh the woman for uh uh, Hunger Games. Uh, Suzanne, Collins. Collins. Suzanne Collins is is yeah. similar, and the 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 woman that wrote uh, Divergent, too, has apparently been consultant on mm-hmm. like the scripts and everything, which is interesting because, for the most part, what used to happen is you'd write a book, they'd buy the book, they'd send you a check and say, okay, we're gonna do whatever we want, yeah, and we'll, done, have you fun, know, you know, see you later. But sometimes I wonder if a writer. If you, how much do you take? Because and also the differences the, with those writers, those are series. Those are writers. And this and, is an individual story. Yeah, and, and, and there's a difference between writing a script and, and beats in a script than beats in a book where you mm-hmm. have, you know, a lot more time mm-hmm. to, to, to do your story. So I just think that what Gail had said is an interesting, yeah, it's an interesting way in which the business, the industry has been going uh, to, to an extent, especially with these young adult novels. But again, for a young adult movie, without having read the book, there were parts of it that were refreshing for me because it's not a dystopian future. And the kids, I had a feeling, were sort of kind of real. And I like that. Like, mm-hmm. you know, they weren't saving the world. They were just trying to get along in life and follow their dreams. And that's a good, positive message, yeah. I think, for me. I mean, I also, I liked the the environment that they were in and like visually how the mm-hmm. movie looked. The cinematography was beautiful. I yeah. thought it was, I think. they added a lot for, for, to take a book and to, you know, condense it down into a hour and 45 minute film. Yeah. You do have to make a lot of cuts. We think that they made a lot of cuts. I personally, and from just reading book covers, that they cut out a lot of family time. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting to me that what they then added is they made so many visual choices. Mm-hmm. One, to not to this whole linear thing. Also with a lot of the flashback footage that there was scene flashbacks which were very just like okay this is a normal scene but it's just a different time but then there were also kind of um the way way back flashbacks the way way back flashbacks (laughs) of like early childhood then there were like kind of the morphed flashbacks Uh where things were blurry where it was just kind of this different moment where we also got alternate view flashbacks Mm -hmm. like her mom in the like going into the body bag right yeah a lot of elements were just added and i was i wasn't i didn't find it overwhelming i just found it interesting oh, that yeah. with a fi- with a film that was so chock full of story and of character yeah. and of all these different things going on that they did add so much visually mm-hmm. and i like the the choices because everything was so completely different and individualized right. in a way it kind of reflects just the belief that when you die your whole life flashes before you mm-hmm. and there's so many different things that happened in her life and we could see all those differences and i thought that was a really visually well done mm, yeah and also um you know just the the hospitals in the color palette of just everything really you know the the mod when the present day time is like white and blue and kind of cold yeah. but then the the stories the relationship flashbacks um you know were warm mm-hmm. and you can tell it was family and happy at the yeah time. in in you know the the john de borman because i was like i i thought the movie looked good too and it looked so good that that uh in one uh one interview that i saw uh because the the location is supposed to be portland mm-hmm. um uh they were actually shot in vancouver <laughs> not too mm-hmm. far away i guess but I mean, I thought the location was important, but the way that it looked. Um, but then when I looked up John DeBorman, I mean, he's done a lot of TV. One of my favorite shows, like Justified, and Justified, you know, where that takes very place. Very styled. Very styled, but it wasn't overly so. I guess another thing, too, I was glad that they didn't make a supernatural element to this movie. Like, she wasn't a ghost that could walk through walls. I agree. Like, that would have been it would have mm-hmm. taken away they could have definitely i don't know how it is in the book mm-hmm. i don't know if she is you able know, to just move wherever she yeah wants. i don't know if she's ghostish yeah i agree she I, had physical limitations exactly in i like the physical element they still kept the fact that she is still present 
physically present yes because you see when she's walking around and running around the hospital all these people like there there was a quick moment where like a nurse was like move her shoulder just slightly to have her pass through so you can tell in all the actors that they had to like physically purposely avoid her Mm -hmm. when also another situation when adam's like looking through that glass door window towards the operating room and she's standing right in front of him so you know like they're purposely not having any contact with her right which must have been difficult that that and also and i think that just helps with the film budget as well just very Mm -hmm. just to be practical sure Yeah. yeah and but i think if there were an ethereal component mm-hmm. it would have taken away it was a nice like if you, it was if a you have nice people choice. walking through people mm-hmm. and opening and the door stuff. farther than you normally right. would so two people can pass yeah. through it and i almost got a sense too although i'm not sure if it was conscious or not but it seemed that she was tethered to her body like but then again there were other parts where she was going all over the hospital you did seemed, but at the beginning it was like she gets onto the ambulance even though and you wonder what would have happened if she had stayed yeah i'm like oh oh, is she tethered you know is there what's the limitation but um all in all it played out nicely that her spirit her soul Mm -hmm. was for the audience in any case a a physical being yeah i thought another just like small fact that they added that was played off really well is Recently, in like TV and film, we see a lot of use of technology, mm-hmm. of phones, of Facebook, of mm-hmm. Twitter, and plays in. And it's all, normally it's like we get like a full insert shot of like <laughs> hands Text. and like typing. And sometimes you're just like, oh, it's a little abrasive. Mm-hmm, Calm right. it down. And I think that they did that well in this as well. For instance, when they do have the friend to show her the picture, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just very subtle and played off to me as like very realistic as our time right now or when she did do just like the casual like whatever it was like stalking of her boyfriend in class and it wasn't like let me fill up the whole screen as much with these pictures and like overwhelm you it was just like also oh, this they is used the technology I think it was as a necessity. done well yeah. though yeah. because yeah. The, when I they agree. did use technology it would go into a flashback well, or, or like yeah. when they showed a or photo of it was the, from- the mom and her with the headphones when she was a little girl right. it went back to that flashback yeah. so yeah. they used it as a storytelling and they used the yeah, cell phone but it was as a like, means of it was just like it was just yeah. nicely right. done it wasn't overly done mm-hmm. they weren't constantly texting and twittering or yeah. whatever it is yeah, it was. When there when there needed to be a conversation when he was elsewhere is touring, mm. she picked up her phone and they yeah. had a conversation and then the you know. So yeah, I know I I, I think they just dealt with I think that's been simple. a lot of struggle for people in film sometimes. It was, yeah. Where it does feel abrasive, it does feel like overdone or You're like right. it's and too big. It was just like, okay, it's there. Mm, it comes yeah. in sometimes. And I think that no big deal. That goes with the directing. I mean, RJ Cutler, who's more of a documentary filmmaker he actually put on before at the beginning of production he had a cellist come to his house and he invited the you know the cast and crew members and they put on a concert performance and then went into this like pretty much a workshop of classical Mm -hmm. music and you know just explained the history of music and cellos and i thought that was great and that was a great bonding experience for everyone to just like really understand mm-hmm. what they're trying to do right. and portray the music as well as they could yeah i mean he was a it, it, this is his first narrative film yeah uh, outside of the word of the world of documentary and a you know he he was interested because he read the book uh, he didn't say why he was reading the book but he read the book and he fell in love with the book and he was like, guys could can't like just a little, you know. I don't know. I don't teenage know how romance it, story. I would be curious to know how the book got in his hands. Whether I don't know if he has mm-hmm. kids or, but he read the book. He loved yeah. it. Um, uh, his his he his his way of approach, like for his documentary, he says, well, you know, documentaries like you get all the pieces, and then you got to figure out how am I going to mold this like a piece of clay. It was this. I have a script. It was I have a script. And I know what I'm going to shoot. It's a little bit different. He goes, but the main thing that that both documentary and this narrative form, it's all about story. So, you know, I, you know, I I appreciate the way that he approached, you know, I I appreciate the way that he approached it. I had no problem necessarily with his directing and. and, Yeah, I think he did a great job directing um, and how to execute it. Because if you think about it, 
the story does take place from Mia's perspective, and he's a f- documentary filmmaker, which is a very voyeuristic perspective sure. on everything. So, and we, we're it. seeing the whole world through Mia's eyes, mm-hmm. just like a documentary. Yeah. Right? Well, Sarah, you brought up the point too, and I think it's important to note because you said that it was very, they didn't rely on technology, that it was very, um, uh, like from from natural. a money perspective, it was practical. natural, it was practical. The, the the production budget was 11 million 11 only 11 11 million so you know that's pretty good in this mm-hmm. day and age yeah i mean um, they they currently how much do we know they're, they're like they're at least 38 million plus yeah, worldwide it's 40, you know, 45, yeah. 45 domestic now. and it's mm-hmm. like 51 worldwide now the the total budget is 38 million so Warner Brothers really okay. kicked in. I mean, that far surpasses mm-hmm. the 11 mil- million budget. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, they, they hit it hard. They had a lot of, there was a lot of outdoor campaigning. And that, that's what's crazy to me is that the $11 million movie, <laughs> movie. Was, sh- oh, was, I thought, a pretty good movie. I thought that actually the, even though they spent like $20 million, I thought that the marketing for this movie hurt it. You did. I personally did. Like, really? Yeah, I did not like. Per- I didn't like the marketing. How, how so? Uh, it just seems like another love story. It seems kind of cute. Mm. Um, I didn't get anything about like, like I understood there were musicians, sure. but I didn't really get that that was like there was a dream involved, or there was like conflict with that dream, or was that it was about body family. Yeah. All I knew is she was out of body experience, and that she had like a boyfriend that she like really loved, and it was what was holding her there. Yeah, okay. That's what I got. I didn't see any of the conflict other than she was obviously in a coma. Okay. Yeah. Like, that's what I was getting. I didn't get anything about, like, her family, about how she was making this decision, about how she had passions. All I got was like, oh, it's another little love story. Yeah. And you see, when I, first saw, when I first saw the trailer, there was a lot of music involved. I knew there was an accident going on, so we knew it was a dramatic film. Yeah. And me, I think just me just being a fan of classical music and her playing the cello, I was automatically drawn to it. I mean, I went to go see this movie when it first came out because I just wanted to see it. So for me, I didn't think the marketing. Yeah, I didn't like it. I didn't like it. I saw posters of it everywhere. And I know the poster caught on. And I know that that whole like. Yeah, and like, it, 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 it spawned Still a whole. Today. Yeah, yeah it spawned a whole I saw thing. It like it's three around times today. on the yeah. way here, and it spawned this whole thing where I know like fans were creating their own like similar collages. Oh, I'm glad you brought that up because I want to talk about fandom on young adult novels. But no, you're right. I mean, it's like, still all over the place. That happened, but to me, it just made it seem like oh, it's just it's just it's just Another a cheesy, cheesy do, love do story you think, that there's not much else going on. Yeah, do you think? And it was more than that for the, me. The timing was good for this for the film, release of the film, considering. Oh, absolutely. We just had Fault in Our Stars like two months ago. Yeah, but two, in today's ago, right? in today's in today's distribution world, I think the timing would, couldn't have been better for this movie because had it come out say before Fault in Our Stars, it probably would have gotten creamed. Uh, it mm-hmm. wouldn't. I don't think it would have made forty million, forty and a half million, or forty two million today. Um, just you know, going back to the marketing, I, I'd seen the trailer. And for me, I'm a Chloe Moritz fan, and I was like, this looks like this could be a good role for her. Um, and then when the movie came out and the reviews were what they were, that sort of kind of was like, oh, that's too bad. But um, I didn't mind the trailer, the posters and such. However, I think the timing for this movie, uh, and I had a conversation with our good friend Ian Kaiser mm-hmm. the other day about timing and mm-hmm. release of the movie, because timing certainly helped guardians of the galaxy Mm -hmm. i think it certainly helped this movie too because let's face it the past four weeks of movies there's been nothing out Mm -hmm. so well summer's winding down so winding that's to be expected it like died in like august so when they released this movie in august 22nd i don't believe it was number one but it had enough breathing room uh, it got an A- in cinema score. So the teenagers who went to see it, they really liked it. So it built up a good word of mouth in order to get it to this 40 plus million dollars. Had it been released in May, June, or July, I think... It would have lost. Oh, it would have oh, been, been completely you know, lost in the shuffle. shuffle. Yeah, so uh-huh. they picked a great time because there's really nothing mm-hmm. else. There's not much to compete with it. And uh, maybe that's why they also had such a huge marketing push. Because yeah. they were like, wait, guys, everyone's talking right now about what is there to see? What is there to see? If you put in everyone's faces, these posters, maybe they're going to be like, 
Oh, well, there is that. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, I think and, that's and why it's for their teens, too. Yeah. And I'm sure the trailer was on. Uh, you saw Fault of Our Stars, mm-hmm. right? Yes. Was the trailer on there when you saw it? The, I would, the I If I Stay? Oh, the yeah. If I Stay. It might have been. Oh, I've seen a lot of movies in between. Because that would have been, yeah, yeah. I mean, it would have made sense. I'm sure that Warner mm, Brothers yeah. heavily targeted Fault in Our Stars for this. But again, I think that the marketing reached out to the to the crowd that they wanted. I think the release date that they picked was perfect. Uh, and that it's really written. Mm-hmm. I mean, because when, when you look at box office, the only thing you're really hearing about is Guardians of the Galaxy. Mm-hmm. Um not that that's necessarily a bad thing, but to look and see that this movie is still in like the top five, that you're like, wow. And the mere fact that it's $40 million, I was like, mm-hmm. And I geez, also think it's, you know, that's... word of mouth, because when I came out of the film, I immediately told three people about it, that Did I you? saw it. Yeah. yeah, and I was like, I was telling people, I was like, hey, yeah. I just saw this. It was pretty good. You should go see it. Yeah, and it's interesting because the Rotten Tomatoes score is a 38%, which not great. Yeah. Not good at all. However, Huge in, jump from Rotten Tomatoes to Cinema yeah. Score. Like yeah. that, it's that's a that's a big division. I feel like normally, if you got an A minus movie, you're getting at least eighty percent. Um, we yeah, and like we that, had that last week. Yeah, with um, yeah. the game stands tall with seventeen yeah. percent, and Rotten to me, uh, and Cinema Score was an, an A minus. That's crazy it's to me. It's I normally I feel like we don't see that big of jumps. Yeah, from those two sites. Yeah, what the critics' opinion and then the audience' mm. opinions and yeah, well, there's a huge disparity. But again, when you're talking the teenage girls, I, a lot of them may have read the books. I, I mean, mm. I don't know, but an A minus for word of mouth is really good. And I think since uh, how many weeks between August twenty second and now three, four, it's been yeah, three, uh, it's three, solid three weeks. weeks. Yeah, we're we're, we're September twelfth. I think that it's just perpetuated and it's had a nice steady stream. Yeah. You know, the box office is coming in. I don't know how much repeat their business they're getting. However, I'm still hearing about it. Yeah. I still see the they haven't taken the bus shelters no. and the billboards down yet. <laughs> so, you know, Warner Brothers on this movie, I think they're they're, 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 they're just letting it ride. Ha- yeah. They're just letting it ride until they have something that they can like really Which is great. You know, and they should. And Absolutely. they should because, mm-hmm. you know, we do need that filler i don't want to call this movie a filler but we need something that can get us to the oscar season yeah and and again it's the way movies the movie has time to breathe much like guardians of the galaxy guardians of the galaxy you're not going to change the quality of the movie but however again had that movie come out in may june july or but it got lost with the other marvel mm, movies it, already out and with trans Transformers and with Godzilla and with this, it, 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 yeah, it it would have done well. It would have gotten the same amount of great word of mouth, the same amount of great criticism. But the, our, our like we've had so much to pay attention to movie wise that when a movie came out in August and there wasn't that much out, hey, Guardians of the Galaxy, hey, let's go see that movie. There's nothing else I want to see. Yeah, I'm gonna go see if I stay mm-hmm. f- for the girls because what else are they going to say well Dimitri I don't think you're going to see this movie again no but would you listen to the soundtrack would you buy the soundtrack I would I kind of want to buy it today <laughs> after you- after this podcast I will go download it on iTunes I agree I thought the soundtrack was absolutely amazing um, I don't know if it's a movie I will buy um, it's not a movie that I'm like a- got a good cry in there a couple times. Did you cry? You know? I got very, very Misty, teary-eyed. Because, of course, I go to the movie theaters at all the most civilian hours. So I'm surrounded by the teenagers, the, the you know, the women who love to cry. I was and in this movie. Of course, I had two women on both of my, like, both sides of me, you know, just Okay, bawling. I'm going to, a very embarrassing moment. I, I did saw tear it up, though. I saw it yesterday at 11.35. I was the only person in the audience and I'm like going I just know that somewhere there's a projection a male projection is going <laughs> what a whip. like because I was and then one just as the movie like all the trailers went through and I was like mm-hmm. this is my living room I you know even when they said oh pick your seat I was like you're kidding me right <laughs> she goes yeah pick your seat I said do you want to come I said I have a whole living room to myself <laughs> and one woman walked in literally and I'm like going oh my god she's I, I go I just know this will happen to me she's either gonna sit right next to me or right behind me even though she had a whole theater to pick oh, no. she sat like two rows behind me she's probably going 
what is he doing here? Like, why is he saying this? It was me and and one woman who was probably by herself and in her 80s. (laughs) And then I was the one crying. And I was like... I was like, I was like, the old lady better be crying. That sounds mean. Like, she was such a sweet lady. Like, she looked so friendly. And I was like, and I'm like crying, and I am like three rows behind her, and I'm like, stop crying. I was was surrounded by so many crying people. But then again, it was a Wednesday. uh, Yeah, it was a Thursday at 11:35. It was eerie, and I'm just. Mine was Friday at 7 p.m. At 7 p.m. Yeah, yeah, and you know, listen, the movie's been doing well. you know now soundtrack i don't know if i'd buy the soundtrack um i liked i like the what? covers well, they they had a lot of covers in this um i this was film. impressed with um um uh, uh, jamie blackley apparently mm-hmm. he sang all his stuff Sings live. Yeah, and he knows how to know play that. guitar I, I didn't know I, he was I, in the cast of spring awakening i believe in england okay so he's i mean that's a pretty tough musical so yeah yeah and he he's, has the singing chops he does and he and, has guitar chops too and I, but I literally thought they brought in some, I don't know, a, a singer to do it. I didn't know that he did the singing. I mean, the, their music to me, it, it came off. They were sort of kind of like, for me anyways, it was sort of kind of like a, they were like a little bit replacements and then a little bit of uh, Mumford and Sons. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, I wish that. I almost wish they were like a little Mumford bit. Yeah, I almost wish they were a little bit edgier in, in the line of. Uh, like Scott Pilgrim's band was. Mm, I thought yeah. that they were going to be a little bit more edgier, but, but it was Scott fine. But Scott Pilgrim's, that movie was so more fast paced, so the music reflected that. Right. And then this one was more of a slower pace, so I can understand the more chill, more calm, more classical type just, of And just music. a quick fact to throw it out there, um, he was a singer, he's done training for it, but for this movie, they specifically had him brush up with lessons from Simon Tong, who's from the gor- <laughs> from Gorillas. Yeah. And they had him come in and like make sure, you know, just get a couple of lessons in there since everything was good. He had a lot of songs to sing. And and um, in the band that was in this film, his band, they those boys actually performed together for a few times before mm-hmm. they even started filming yeah. just to, you know, get that chemistry down and perform. Yeah, I perform. felt that there were a band. Um, I don't know... Because something that came up is uh, what was the name of their their uh, oh something stone or with the water, W watershed with, yeah. stone or something People, white stone I will find or out. something the band <laughs> the band well you know it's funny because I I found an article that said uh, you know is waterstone or a real band and I never got that sense but then when I you know I was thinking of almost famous with the mm-hmm. I think it's um white no it's um. Fever Dog. You know, uh, like that yeah. felt like a real band. Uh, in still, a water. still Water. Still Water. Felt like a like, like, like a real band of that era. Um, but it was, you know, I thought he did a good job. I mean, he, he sold it as being a rock star or, 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 or an aspiring rock star. Mm-hmm. You could see that, you know, they, they, they played the clubs, um, you know, and it had that good sort of kind of vibe to it. You know, the music itself for me, like I probably won't buy the soundtrack i was curious to see and i was curious what band performed the songs because i honestly didn't was, know until i was researching the movie that it was actually yeah them. him doing it. there were a lot of covers in this film and i tend to be a fan of covers and mm-hmm. stuff um the one particular cover that i want to talk about the beyonce's halo cover um actually sung by ann brun and linnea olsen Chloe During Grace Moretz actually scene. found that cover on the online, and she suggested that song to the director R.J. and it made the film. Wow! Yeah, so you know that just, was the song that was their sex scene song. Yeah, and then <laughs> she found um, it. And then we had the Smashing Pumpkins mm-hmm. today, which I thought they killed it. Yeah, same here. It was. Uh, I my favorite, probably my favorite scene of the whole film was the bonfire scene. And and it was her favorite day. It was, it was Mia's favorite day yeah. in her life. Just amazing but. how amazing it was because it was that perfect mix of people singing, having fun, her playing the cello, and him doing the guitar, like acoustic guitar. It was just so well done. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm a fan of the music. I probably, now talking about it, I will go buy it after this. Yeah, I'm curious um, to know how the soundtrack to this is is playing. Because, you know, in, in entertainment mm-hmm. news, 
you know the soundtrack that we hear about now is is Guardians of the Galaxy. I was curious. Yeah. I was just surprised about this soundtrack. Yeah, I was just surprised how much music was a factor in this film. I thought it was going to be a more dramatic story, mm-hmm. but I didn't realize how involved music was. Going well, to be. Music even- has also become a huge thing in the between young know, adult film, and honestly, you have Absolutely. to give credit to Twilight for it. I yeah, yeah, I really no, I think that saying. that franchise was what started this whole buying the soundtrack thing or releasing mm-hmm. the songs early it was huge i no, mean obviously I, I movies have had wonderful soundtracks and scores for the years but i think that that twilight really started a phenomenon with how many people bought theirs and now it's become a thing that if you're going to have a teen movie you need to have well, all over the map. i mean i'm gonna go back i, I mean i would kind of go against like, that a little bit i mean oh i totally think it inspired like the hunger well, games but, and well, but all if you think about like on. big films like harry potter star wars people buy those soundtracks before and the, you know those are well, just but like, that's, a, up that's more music. yeah, yeah well score. no if you want to talk i mean but the trend to buy into... soundtracks was way more popular than twilight has ever been it, well yeah. Star Wars is a different category. Yeah, score. I mean, I can talk but about... But buying but, soundtracks but, 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 well, has I'm been a big about, thing like, before but, that. But I'm talking about, like, added music. Um, mm-hmm. Like, not necessarily score. You're talking you about, know. like, finding the popular artists. Or, I call it, or like, source. Mm-hmm. And, you know, movies, you know, we'll go back to movies like Beverly Hills Cop. There was a time where movies, Ghostbusters, mm-hmm. uh, where, where, where the music in the movie was selling a soundtrack to, like, crazy numbers. That's when both the movie business and the music industry sold things differently. Today, I do agree with you. Twilight, you know, I mean, For the before Twilight, market. we had, like, the Spider-Man movies and things like that. Now things are downloadable. You know, I'm not saying that Twilight reinvented the wheel but for the young adult novel you know it made it big to sell some more music it sparked it um hunger games doesn't necessarily have i would say it's a little bit more score driven until the end of the movie where they get like a taylor swift to do a song this one was the actual movie yeah for hunger games i would agree i'm but they have a whole publicity Correct. stint about the soundtrack Absolutely. that they give where mm-hmm. they have some like the biggest names yes. bands. They make an that, alternative soundtrack to, yeah. to sell. Which is huge. And I think that comes from I this think whole that came young from Twilight. Yes. Because Twilight did the same thing. Mm-hmm. And and again, you know, putting music putting music into movies is not a new thing. Uh, in many cases it's packaged. You know, the music people they vie for their artists to be on an album. Yeah. And again, and this dates back you know, even before me and such, but I, I do. I, I look back to the '80s, uh, where where soundtracks were huge and they got play on the radio like a lot. So you know, a movie that gains that attention, they can get a lot of people to buy a soundtrack. Now this doesn't. But have, even this soundtrack has Bach on it. Y- well, yeah, and yeah. it'll be interesting to see. It has a nice variety. How it? Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how. I'm interested to know about the sales of this soundtrack. Um, mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. again, it's mostly of a band that doesn't exist, but they played their own music. So I'll give them that credit because I didn't know that. Um, and it didn't have much source music. Like the Smashing Pumpkins song is a cover. It's not the Smashing Pumpkins playing that. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. It, it, it's interesting. I, yeah. I don't, you know. But sometimes covers sell amazingly. Oh, absolutely. I mean, hello, Glee. Thanks. I mean, that's. All of Glee. Point and I, taken. There I mean, you go. It's absolutely correct. Anything else about this film? I, I, you know, overall, I fairly enjoyed it. Um, I thought visually it was well done. Acting, of course, Chloe was amazing, and we got to look out for Jamie Blackley too. I think he's mm-hmm. on definitely on the American list of up and up people, even though he is British. But we should definitely look out <laughs> for him now. We love the Brits. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he, we do. He was good. Um, for for what this film was for a t- young young adult film, I thought it was really well done. Sarah, um, I I mean I feel like I'm kind of repeating myself, but I enjoyed the music. There were some really good scenes that got a, the emotional reaction. I think the filmmakers were looking for out of me, mm-hmm. um, and it was it was interesting. I mean, it's I. I don't think I'm gonna buy this movie, but I did enjoy watching it, or make at least I was. Well, actually, I was sad watching it, but sad in, <laughs> yeah. a, in, a, in a good way. Yeah, I. Again, it made you feel something. Yeah, it made yeah. me feel angry when I was done. Mm-hmm. I, like oh, I no. said, it had built up some goodwill, um, you know, and I and I I wanted to 
touch it. I didn't want to come in like a complete hater and say, I, I did find this positive act, positive aspects to this movie. I just felt within the last half hour, whatever goodwill with me that it had earned, that it just blew it all away. I still, I, I can't buy a grandfather being okay with her, or with his only living relative at this point, his only tie to his son. I can't buy that that dialogue. I really have a hard time giving up the will to live, and that's the way I saw it. She was going out to the light. She was going to open the door and say, "Sayonara." Okay, well, I'm out I'll of end us on a positive note. <laughs> I enjoyed it. Yeah, and even if it was that, like, I admit, I don't buy I'm, that stuff. I'm a sucker for the sappy scenes. And definitely, the, I enjoyed the sappy scenes in this film. I'm a sucker so, for sappy scenes. Emotional too. scenes. Except yes. telling people to emotional die. Emotional sappy scenes. <laughs> I thought it was great. All right, where can we follow all of you to keep talking about amazing films, Dimitri? I am at uh, at D Movies One Seven Zero One. I, I think I'm up to twenty five followers. Yeah. It's, oh yeah. Definitely I'm, follow him. You, you're I'm constantly blazing a path. Of blazing a trail on the Twitter. a trail. The Twitter sphere. That, right. that everybody just seems to put out by yeah. just a little stomp. <laughs> and Sarah, you do not have a Twitter. <laughs> I do not. And in the future, I think she will be. But um, you can follow me on Twitter at Sarah Feeney TV. Even though we talk about film, sir. I talk about media in general. You do, and, then, and I favorite some of your tweets, and you're kind enough to favorite some of mine. There you go. So. And then you can follow all of us here at Anatomy of a Movie on our website. Check out our fun dissections that we have coming up down the pipeline. A lot of great films. We have the Oscar season coming up, so a lot of films to talk about. Well, we've got the whole... We're going into... Oh, yeah. We're, October, we're going November, going December. crazy. Yeah. And then you can follow us on Twitter at Movie Anatomy. And then check out all of our fun dissections. And we also get to your comments and questions and news-related items in our other sections that we have. So check those out, too. Thank you all for listening to the If I Stay Dissection. If I Stay. And thank you for requesting this. And, and we... Oh, let us know about. since you didn't yeah. request us. Request yeah. other movies yeah. if you want to. So And let us know what you think about this one since you did request it. Exactly. Did we do it justice for you? Is it what you would hope for? Exactly. Definitely check everything out. Thank you guys. We'll see you for our next dissection. From producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the rest of the Anatomy of a Movie staff, we would like to thank you for listening and subscribing to the show. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to email or tweet us. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been Anatomy of a Movie.